from Psalm 139. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. When the weight of life be to fall when the name of Jesus 
guess I would call For I know my God is in control And His purpose is unshakable It doesn't matter what I feel doesn't matter what I see My hope will always be Your promises to me Now I'm casting out all fear For your love has set me free My hope will always be Your promises to me As I walk into the days to come I will not forget what you have done For you have supplied my every need And your presence is enough for me Doesn't matter what I feel doesn't matter what I see, my hope will always be your promises to me. Now I'm casting out all fear, for your love has set me free. My hope will always be your promises to me. always be more than enough for me you will always be more than enough for me nothing's gonna stop the plans you've made nothing's gonna take your love away you will always be more than enough for me you will always be more than enough for me will always be more than enough for me nothing's gonna stop the plans you made nothing's gonna take your love away you will always be more than enough for me doesn't matter what I feel doesn't matter what I see your hope will always be your promises to me now I'm casting out all fear for your love has set me free my hope will always be in your promises to me doesn't matter what I feel doesn't matter what I see my hope will always be in your promises to me now I'm casting out all fear Love has set me free. My hope will always be your promises to me. Lord Jesus, we just ask that you help us bring these words true. Doesn't matter what we feel, doesn't matter what we see, our hope will always be in you, Lord. Shine through this place and help us to lean on you for that hope to bring to our community here in Elizabethtown, PA, and beyond. These things we pray this morning. Amen. Well, hello and welcome once again to St. Paul's Church. My name is Matt Skillen. I'm one of the pastors here, and we're so glad that you're joining us in worship today. Wherever you might be, wherever you are, you might be watching this on a small screen in a room by yourself or in a large screen surrounded by families and friends. Wherever you are, we, we welcome you in the name of Jesus Christ. We hope at some point that you'll join us at our website at stpauls.faith and do a couple of things for us. First, we would invite you to click on the Connect With Us button. Uh, this will bring you to our digital connection card where you can share uh, whatever contact information you're willing to share with us. We'd love to know how to connect with you. Uh, this is where you can also, number two, find our prayer request link. We'd love to know how God is moving in your life. We take prayer very seriously here at St. Paul's. We lift up every prayer request that comes in during our weekly staff meetings we would love to know how to pray for you. We hope you'll join us there. 
Additionally, we'd like to point out and just say thanks to all of you who partner with us in ministry through your tithes and offerings. Through your generosity, we've been able to continue to be a light for Christ in Elizabethtown and beyond, and it's through your gifts that make all of that happen. Uh, to learn more about partnering with us in this way, you can go to our website, stpauls.faith, to learn more about online giving, text to give, or through regular donations through those offering envelopes that you might have received in the mail, and you can send those into the church at any time. Uh, we thank you so much for all that you do and how much of yourself you share with us. Uh, we don't take that lightly, and we love you very much for it. Would you join me for a moment of prayer as we say thanks to God for all that he's doing? Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you give, for it all comes from you. Lord, we look about and we may have questions, but we know that we are so richly blessed because we know the name of Jesus Christ, who has come to forgive us of our sins. Lord, we have but a small portion that we give back, and we pray that it is multiplied several times over so that your work continues here and beyond. Amen. Grace and peace to you in the name of God, our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ. So glad to have you here joining us for worship today. My name is David Wolverton, and I'm one of the pastors here at St. Paul's Church. St. Paul's Church, it's good to see you. It's good to be with you. As Pastor Matt had shared, whether you're by yourself watching this or you're in a crowded room joining together in worship, we thank you. We thank you for being a part of this congregation and also a part of God's movement. I have the awesome privilege, you know, many weeks to share with you the Word of God, uh, and I plan on doing that in just a moment with you, but I feel pressed to give you a word of encouragement. 
You know, there, there's a lot going on in our world right now. And, and there's a lot going on in your individual lives and in your individual families. I, I know firsthand by, by hearing through the different venues that we have at the church, through our prayer ministries and, and through the conversations that are ongoing, that, that quite a few of us are facing into some difficult times. And I, I want you to know that God's got you and that God's got this, whatever this is that you're facing, he, he's got it. He's got you in the palm of his hand. In fact, uh, the Bible tells us in Isaiah that, that our names are etched in the palm of God's hand. He's got you. Whether you're facing grief at the loss of loved ones or, or, or you're facing difficulties with employment or underemployment or no employment, no matter what you're facing, he's got you. I know some of you are, are dealing with loved ones who are facing into the dying process. And I know that some of you are, are dealing with some really difficult relationship issues. No matter what, God's got you. With that in mind, as we turn our, our ears and our hearts to the Word of God, I invite you to set aside all of those other things right now, just for a few moments, and listen. Listen to God speaking into your lives. Listen boldly. You may just discover a word of encouragement through God's Word that's going to touch your soul today. And to that end, would you join with me as we prepare our hearts and minds for God to speak? Let's pray. O oh Lord God, open your word up to us and open us up to your word. Teach us, Lord, what you would have us learn as you conform our lives into the disciples that you have called us to be. All of this, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Well, I want to start this message today with a, a kind of fun question. And that fun question in simple terms is this. Do you look like your parents? Do you look like your parents? You know, some of the images that I'm going to put up on the, the screen in front of you right now um, may be kind of humorous, but the power of genetics is that most of us have certain features that are connected with our biological parents. For example, the image that you see in front of you right now, a father and a son. They look almost identical. Well, how about these? These images, the uh, parents and children from their own childhood, or perhaps these. We, we may recognize these figures. Some of them are uh, before us quite often, some of them not so often. Do you look like your parents? Or maybe a better question. Do you act like your parents? Come on, we, we got to admit, don't we, that there are times when, when we speak things that we didn't think we would spe be speaking because that used to be what our parents used to say uh, and we said we'd never say that. Or, or do you find yourself doing certain things in the same way, whether it's picking up a cup of coffee the way your mom did or, 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 or doing, doing certain crafts or projects the way your, your dad did? Do you act like your parents? You know, the interesting thing is, you know, we have been in the letter of Galatians in our New Testament. It's a profound book for us to study. 
Uh, It's an even more profound book to to look at historically. When you think back in time, those early believers in Galatia, the the churches that were in what we would know now as as modern-day Turkey, were, were hearing these words from their mentor, the Apostle Paul, and they were hard words to hear. It's almost as if they were, the metaphor that we've been using in this series, that that Paul's words were like a test paper being handed back with a big red F on the top. Uh, They were failing the test. They were failing to live out the basics of what he had been teaching them, everything that he equipped them to be as Christians. And and, and like a good teacher, he he didn't just put a grade on it. He, He has been leading them to learn what it means to be followers of Jesus. And so with all the the comments were also words of encouragement. Last week, Pastor Matt so brilliantly shared with us a a very important segment of Galatians, chapter 3. And he ended his message on some verses that I want to actually go back to, to springboard into chapter 4 today. And what he introduced for us last week was the concept that Paul talks about in Galatians about adoption. Adoption. You know, when we think about adoption, we don't always think about whether we look like our parents or, or we act like our parents, because in adoption, we're not necessarily with our biological set of parents. You know, we have been grafted into another family. And that's the point that was being made. When we talk about adoption, We're actually talking about being grafted into a new family. Dare I say it statistically that somebody, at least, at least some person or persons who are watching this right now, maybe you've been adopted. So you know what this is like. And and maybe there are some who wish they were adopted, right? So... What is this adoption thing when it comes to what Paul is trying to communicate? You know, I have have a very, very dear friend of mine who right now, he and his wife, are planning on adopting a child from China. They had been working on this for a couple of years now, and and all of this is playing out beautifully, and and they've gotten all of the approval. Now they just have to wait for this pandemic to to ease up so that they can fly to China to get this child. But but in talking with my friend a couple weeks ago, he said something almost in passing, but but it didn't escape my ears. In referring to this girl, this young child in in China that they are adopting, he said, my daughter. He was already calling her his daughter. You see, in his heart, in his mind, just like with his wife, in their hearts and minds, they've already grafted this young child who they have not yet met physically. They've already grafted her into their hearts and into their family. So I want to go back just a few verses into chapter 3, the end of chapter 3 of Galatians, where Pastor Matt left off. And I want to use that to kind of gear us up for what Paul has to say in chapter 4. Will you look with me at those verses, starting in verse 26 of chapter 3. It reads this. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, I want to keep that up on the screen for just a few moments and talk about what Paul is actually saying here. 
Notice the phrase in verse 26. He says, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. What this means and what Paul is really stressing to those Galatian believers and to all of us who are reading these words 2,000 years later is that our lives, everything about our relationship with God is not just rooted in our decision to say yes to Jesus. Well, that's important. But our whole relationship with God is actually based on a foundation that happened in a single event in history. And that was the cross of Jesus Christ. When Jesus died on that cross and then a few days later, was resurrected, those two events, the the crucifixion and the resurrection, that for all intents and purposes I'm kind of bringing together as one, that, that single event in history set the stage of building a bridge of adoption where God claimed us as his own. It was what God did. Kind of like my My friend and his wife, as they're anticipating going, claiming their daughter in China, somebody that they haven't met physically yet, going to China to claim their child, it's almost as if they've already adopted her in their hearts. God, through the event of the crucifixion and resurrection, has already adopted those Galatian believers and you and me. In Christ, we are all children of God through faith. And then he goes on in verse 27 to say, For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Humorously, I started this message by asking, Do you do you look like your parents? Do you act like your parents? What Paul is saying is, Do you look like Jesus? What are you putting on when you go out into the world? Are you putting on your faith? Are you putting on the faith that is historically rooted in the cross and the resurrection? Do we enter into that world with a sense that everything about who we are, our entire identity, is bigger than the moments of crisis that we face here and now? So our identity transcends everything that we typically do to kind of set ourselves apart from one another. Paul says, you know, you got to remember, folks, there's no Jew and there's no Gentile. There's no slave. There's no free. There's no male and no female. It's not to say that we don't have those in our context. It's to, it's to say, in God's eyes, we are bigger than that moment. Our identity is rooted historically in the cross and in the empty tomb. And by virtue, we are now children of God. You know, we've been hearing this phrase, we're all in this together. We're we're hearing that almost constantly in our cultural context right now. Uh, it's, it's to get us almost like a rallying uh, cheer cry for, for gathering all of us together so that so we can make it through this pandemic without chewing each other up. We're all in this together. Well, let, let's, let's gather ourselves together and get through this together. Well, that's all fine and good. It's, it's kind of the equivalent for those of us who are watching this in, in Penn State native territory. And so whenever a Penn Stater says, we are, the rest of the room shouts out, Penn State, right? It's a rallying cry that, that reminds us who we are. Well, that same reminder of who we are 
is what Paul is talking about. It's taking that phrase, we're all in this together, one step further. For those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, we are family. We're siblings. And we're children of the Heavenly Father, children of Almighty God. And in Christ, there is nothing that can take that away from us. And in fact, in Jesus Christ, that can give us the confidence to go out into the world and to face whatever it is that we need to face. Knowing that, as Pastor Matt shared last week, we're never alone. We're never alone. See, God has uniquely adopted us. We're already grafted in. And it's because of what Jesus did. Right now, some of us who are watching this, some of us have been struggling with our own personal identity. Some of us have been struggling with with our purpose in life, our sense of mission. Dare I say it, that there might even be somebody watching this video who has even contemplated suicide, feeling the weight of depression and and the weight of of not knowing whether, whether they want a tomorrow. I'm here to tell you that God has you as part of his family. And that makes your life precious to him. It's precious. And not only that, that because of what God has done in adopting you in his family, he has gifted you with a very unique purpose. And that purpose becomes really important. So let's take this one step further. Paul continues in chapter 3, verse 29. He says, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And what's he talking about here? Just very briefly. He's talking about something that happened even further back in history than the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. This is exciting stuff. What he's saying is that God had a plan that actually even predated what we in history identified as the cross of Christ. And that plan was a promise that was was initiated with Abraham all the way back in the book of Genesis. Early on in the book of Genesis, God established a promise, and and he said to Abraham, I'm going to make your life multiply larger than the number of stars in the sky. And that promise is because I have a mission for your descendants, and that mission is for you to be a blessing to the world. And what Paul, the apostle, is saying to the Galatians is that in Jesus Christ now, that adoption of God for each and every one of us connects us with a promise that began from all the way back in the beginning of time. So never underestimate the power of what God can do through your life. He began this journey with one man named Abraham. And he brought, it, he brought it to a, a climax with another person, Jesus. And what Paul is saying to those Galatian believers, in the midst of all of the controversy that's happening to you right now in your church, Galatia, with all of the, the doubt that is being instilled in your minds because of this group called the Judaizers who are saying you need Jesus plus something else, amidst all of that, you need to understand that what Jesus did on that cross and what God did through raising him from the dead, 
and what each and every single one of us who say yes to God's yes of us in Christ are experiencing is a promise that makes us heirs, H-E-I-R-S, heirs to God's wonderful, abundant gift of eternal life. We are heirs. We will receive an inheritance of abundant, eternal life. Think about that for a second. When you're struggling in the midst of whatever it is that you're facing right now in this pandemic, whatever you're struggling with in in life in general, you are an heir to the wonderful gift of abundant, eternal life. And nobody and nothing can take that away from you. Look at what Paul says now as we jump into chapter 4. Starting in verse 4, he says, But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption as children. You know, when you... When you kind of gather in church uh, around Christmas time, we, we often use the word incarnation. Incarnation. Uh, it's a theology word that, that basically talks about what God did in the Christmas story. Giving birth to Jesus here uh, is enfleshment. Incarnation literally is God became flesh to dwell among us. For Paul, this verse of Scripture is his theology of incarnation. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman. So there's a physicality. God, infinite God, became human. Subjected himself to the limitations of humanity. Born under the law, the law that we have been talking about that was designed to point out our need for a Savior. God sent His Son to be born under those limitations. Why? Paul says, to redeem those under the law. You know what that word redeem is? It literally is a word that's a legal term, and it means to buy back. To buy back, so, so to redeem something, when you, you know, most of us hear that word when you're redeeming a coupon. A coupon is, is money that's being added to uh, what the product costs, and the company that, that designed that product is, is saying is we're going to pay forward for you to try our product. What God has done in sending His Son is he sent his son to redeem us, to buy us back from our enslavement, and that's the language that Paul used in chapter 3, our enslavement to the law, to buy us back so that we would have and experience the abundant freedom of adoption. So he bought us back. He adopted us. And by doing so, he created a new pathway. Verse 6, because you are his children, Paul writes, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. The word Abba is an Aramaic term. Aramaic is is kind of a dialect of Hebrew, uh, and, and it's a term of endearment. In other words, it's the equivalent of of our daddy, our daddy. And so so what Paul is saying is, in effect, when we were adopted as God's children, God gave us, each and every one of us, 
His Holy Spirit to come and to be within us. And, and the Holy Spirit in us empowers us to have an intimate connection to the heart of God. What Paul is saying is the old way of having that connection with God was through rituals, through, through religion, through, through sacrifices and, and burnt offerings. And, and with Jesus dying on the cross and, and rising to new life, none of that is needed anymore. None of it. We have direct access to the heart of God. So much so that that new pathway is a pathway of intimacy. At any given moment, all we need to do is say, Father, Lord, Jesus, Daddy. And we will feel the, the powerful presence of the God who gives himself away, the God who loves us. And so in effect, we take that one step further. In verse 7, Paul says, so you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. We are forever placed into the heart of the God who placed his heart in us. He adopted us in advance. And all we need to do is to say yes to his yes of us. So, what Paul is doing in this letter is he's describing the difference between religion, the old way, and relationship. And the challenge for the Galatians as he takes it back to this issue of the Judaizers impacting their faith is he says in verse 9, but now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you're turning your back on these, those weak and miserable, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do, do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? He says, you're, you're observing special days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. That's a passionate statement of, of Paul looking at the people that he loves and cares for and, and trying to rebuke them in a way that recaptures their sense of common sense. In other words, what Paul is saying is this. He's saying, why do you want to go back to the old way of the law? where you were servants and slaves to a religion and a religious system rather than to live in the freedom of the grace that God gives to you, the, the God who adopted you and made you heirs. Why would you want to do that? That's a great question, isn't it? See, for us and our purposes, there are way too many of us who are still limiting ourselves to religion. We go through our routines. We go through our rituals. And we never cross to that level of intimacy with God that God died to provide. God wants us to feel so confident about our relationship with him, a relationship of intimacy with him, that we trust the cross and the empty tomb to define how we therefore interact with our world. God wants us to reflect his image, to be fully who we are, fully who we are, each and every one of us in all of our diversity, each and every one of us in, in all of our personalities and idiosyncrasies, and trust me, we all have them. Every time I look in the mirror, I, I know we, I am looking at a, a person with many idiosyncrasies. 
But in all of our diversity, we're family. We are family because God has adopted us. So do you look like your heavenly Father? Do you act like Jesus? I, I don't know about you, but, but the concept of looking like God and acting like Jesus, that just floors me. I can't do it on my own. And here's the thing. God knows. That's why he gave his Holy Spirit to us. And it's God's Holy Spirit that empowers us to be like Jesus in the world. So maybe in today's world, in today's culture, in today's situation of, uh, of the pandemic, of the racial tensions, of everything else that's yet to come our way, maybe the question is, do we love like Jesus? That connects us to the basics of what Paul is trying to teach those Galatian believers and what he's trying to teach us. Do we love like Jesus? Maybe that's the place to start. Maybe that's the place to start. Will you pray with me? Father God, I thank you. Thank you for adopting us. Even from a distance, Lord, you saw throughout history the, the gifts, the, the skills, the personalities, the differences, the, you know, the uniqueness that makes us who we are. And, and you said, I want that person in my family. And you reached out through, through time and, and you grabbed a hold of us and you brought us into your presence, into your family. And you connected us with, with sisters and brothers that are as unique. And while, while bringing us together, you, you could expect that we would be fighting all the time because that's what brothers and sisters do. And in fact, that happens. But through it all, you remind us that we are united at the cross of Jesus Christ. So Lord, we want to look like our Heavenly Father and we want to act like Jesus, our brother. And we want to love like he has taught us to love. And by doing so, we want those who look at us to see you and to give you praise. It is to that end, Lord, that we, we say thank you and we love you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, thank you again for joining us for this time of worship. Uh, we, we believe that God has given us an opportunity to put him first. And if you're watching this and, and you want to put Jesus Christ first, uh, we want you to take that opportunity now. Just say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, thank you for loving me. I'm trusting you with my whole heart. Forgive me for everything that I may have done that has, that has borne more of my sinfulness before you than anything else. I'm placing myself at the foot of the cross. And I'm trusting you to adopt me into the household of God. Friends, if you prayed that prayer and if you believe in your heart you are saying yes to the God who says yes to you. We believe that you are beginning a new life in Christ today. Would you let us know? 
send an email to, to me, to Pastor Matt or Pastor John, to, to send, send an email to the church and let us know so we can celebrate that with you. We are looking forward to sharing this new journey with you. And we are trusting that God, God is doing something new in all of us. So God bless you. Have a great week. And let's remember, it's our job to love like Jesus. Amen.